Okay, then uh, let's start. Um, yeah, well, first of all, um, yeah, thank you for having me. I was a bit surprised at the invitation from, from Steven, um, because I'm not a long time Amiga developer, and I'm also not a software developer at all, but um, yeah, here I am, giving a presentation about software. So let me see how this works over here. Um, so I'm going to start with a, with a small introduction and then I'm going to give a small overview of uh, the basics of NVMe. Uh, where to start with uh, driver development and I will show you a bit about the architecture of the driver itself. Then I finish the presentation with some performance figures and if there are any questions then um, and there's still room to answer them. I'm not sure if it's now 10 past 10, my local time. Yep. So I'm not sure if there's any pending. But well, let's see, uh, let's see how it goes. <coughs> For those who do not uh, know me, my name is uh, Harald Kanning, or Harold Kanning, also known as Gena. Geen naam is uh, Dutch for no name. We simply did not have any inspiration to come up with a catchy nickname, so <laughs> that's where uh, Geen naam comes from. You might know me from the uh, high definition audio driver for OS4, or this driver, the NVMe driver. And if you still don't know me, you might know me from my um, um, strong opinions on Amiga websites. So why did I develop the NVMe driver? Uh, yeah, it's my passion to, to play around with uh, new technology. So uh, yeah, when I bought my X5K, I didn't really want to search the uh, the marketplaces for some used old uh, audio card. Um, I thought, well, I want to use a card that I can buy in my local store. So why not develop a driver for it? And that's what I did. And um, yeah, well, when, when the driver was mature enough, I was looking for new opportunities. And um, yeah, there was this nice PCI Express slot available in my X5K. Um, I don't run any other operating system, so it is yeah, it was currently unused. Um, so yeah, why not make use of it? So basically, the only um, real um, yeah, I think that I really wanted was that there must be a specification available. Without specification, I need to reverse uh, engineer drivers or look into Linux drivers. It was really not my thing because I'm not really a software developer. So. Um, yeah, then I thought, why not start with NVMe? Because NVMe will eventually make uh, SATA obsolete. You can already see it on the PC world. Uh, laptops, but also uh, desktop PCs are not shipped with uh, DVD drives anymore. And it's just a matter of time that also the hard disks will, uh, will be replaced with, with NVMe disks. So that's where the idea came from. Now, what is NVMe? Uh, NVMe is short for Non-Volatile Memory Express and, uh, well, to be honest, this name doesn't really cover the standard itself because uh, Non-Volatile Memory can be anything, it can be an optical drive, it can be a magnetic uh, media like a standard hard disk. But in this case, it is really targeting uh, NAND flash-based memory. Um, and the reason for that is shown in the uh, image in the uh, in the right bottom of the screen. Um, in the upper part, you see the average setup for, an, uh, for a SATA uh, hard drive. Um, you have your expansion card that you can fit into your PCI or PCI Express slot. It will talk to an advanced host controller interface, so your SATA controller. Uh, and on turn, it will talk to your SATA uh, hard drive. And if you look at the 
at the top, you can see that um, yeah, the, the delay between your PCI um, interface and your uh, host controller interface is a single digit microsecond. And between your advanced uh, host controller and your actual hard drive, it is about yeah, two digit microseconds. <coughs> And this all doesn't matter because the real delays between your safety controller and your platters, your uh, optical storage, and that's in a millisecond. So a factor 1,000 larger than, than uh, yeah, between your host controller and your safety controller or on the design part itself. Um, so yeah, it's it's really redundant. It's, uh, it, it doesn't matter. But this all changed when um, hard drives. Uh, got flash memory instead of uh, this optical storage. So uh, suddenly the delay between the SATA controller in your hard disk and your storage flash memory was in the double digit microseconds. So now the delay between uh, your SATA, your advanced host controller and your uh, SATA hard drive was suddenly, uh, suddenly dominant. So that is basically the reason why you have to invent a new standard to um, yeah, to fully make use of the power of of um, of NVMe or of uh, flash-based storage, um, and that's basically what you see at the bottom of this picture. Again, you have the PCI Express interface, this case PCI Express, but there is no controller in between. It directly connects to the drive. Um, yeah, and that that. Overall, there is a lot less delay, and um, that will um, ensure that you can get a lot more performance from these kind of drives. So, uh, yeah, that's basically the reason uh, behind uh, behind the introduction of NVMe. Now, NVMe was also designed with um, multiprocessing uh, in mind. We'll come to that later. Um, and it is still block-based, so you do not use direct addressing, but you still address blocks like normal SATA drives. And uh, there is also some kind of persistent rumor that uh, SATA drive, or NVMe drives uh, need 4K uh, logical blocks, but that is not true. Um, what NVMe drives need is 4K host memory patches, so your uh, whole uh, uh, memory management on your host needs to um, uh, divide your DDR memory in 4K pages. And, well, that is true for Amiga OS. So um, there's no, no reason why NVMe shouldn't work on, on the Amiga. So that's, what I, uh, that's why I uh, uh, wrote this driver. Now, uh, NVMe is uh, a very layered structure, and the reason for that is that it, they want it to be as flexible as possible. So, your actual flash memory is called a namespace, and um, this one is part of what they call an NVMe set, but an NVMe set can contain one or more namespaces. There's uh, not really a restriction um, uh, to that, but um, yeah, for now, I don't see a reason why they use it, and I haven't seen on any drive that they use multiple namespaces, but it is a possibility. And um, an NVMe set is on its turn part of an endurance group. Now, I can understand why you want to use uh, multiple endurance groups, because um, I can imagine that you want to mix, for example, NAND flash with NOR flash, and NAND flash has a different endurance uh, than NOR flash. So I can imagine that an, an NVMe drive can contain two endurance groups, uh, one with uh, NAND flash for your bulk storage, and one with NOR flash for example a bootloader or something, something that needs to uh, be persistent for a long time, uh, even when the drive is not powered. Um, and the endurance groups on their turn are together with the controller part of the domain, but here again um, an NVMe drive can contain different domains. And these domains connect to a port, and uh, a port can be a PCI Express interface, but it can also be an Ethernet interface, an, um, um, 
Is sorry, is is internet following my speech? Yeah. Yeah. Because I see a delay in what I present and what I see on YouTube. Yeah, oh, don't worry about it. You're coming through perfectly fine, Harold. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, hey, it's just a long delay. Yeah, it's the best thing to do. It's a very long delay on YouTube. One question about the endurance groups. Um, in the endurance group, do you know if you can control the oversubscription amount? Sorry, D. In the concept of the endurance group for an NVMe, when they're created, um, do you know if that's something, is that like a drive level feature, or can a user create no, 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 no. oversubscription? No, no, no. It is really um, something that's created on the hardware level, so it's not configurable. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, no, so, so what I want to show you here is, is simply an, an overview of, of how NVMe is constructed um, and how flexible it can be. So you see namespaces, sets, endurance groups, controllers, domain support, and the standard doesn't really have a restriction how you can combine these into an NVMe drive. Um, so, um, yeah. The good thing is you can configure it according to your needs as an hardware manufacturer. Um, the bad thing is then I have to write a very complex driver to support it all. But what I've seen so far with all the drives that I've tested is that uh, all the drives simply contain one of each. So one namespace in one set, one endurance group, one in controller, and obviously one port because we only have one uh, PCI Express interface. Um, but I can imagine for, for enterprise kind of systems uh, that you want to have uh, something like um, a fail-safe connection with a crossover PCI Express port, uh, those kind of things. But um, yeah, I just want to say the standard allows it, but uh, the commercial uh, NVMe drives don't use it. They simply use one of each. Um, so how do you communicate then with the host? I mean, we have to support the PCI Express interface, and how, is, how, how does communication uh, work on the PCI Express interface? Now, that is basically the same as every PCI Express type of card that I've seen so far. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's HDI, VO, graphics card, or, or in this case, a storage card. Um, you all have to um, 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 yeah. What is what is the word? A software lens. Not really declare, but you have to um, create ring buffers in main memory. So um, um, you simply um, yeah create in your DDR memory uh, buffers, which, which are used to, to communicate, these buffers uh, do have uh, certain requirements, uh, like it has to be aligned, uh, in this case, uh, on a uh, 128 byte boundary. Uh, yeah, that can be different for each type of PCI Express uh, card. Um, but in this case, it was uh, 128 bytes. Um, you need to create an, what they call a submission queue. In this queue, you uh, simply post the commands that you want to send to your NVMe controller. And, and when this command has been processed, the result will be stored in the completion queue, that is the C queue. Now, they make an, uh, a separation between uh, the administration side of the drive, so everything concerning the configuration and initialization of your drive, and uh, between um, transferring data to and from your flash memory. Because for flash memory, they use uh, what they call an uh, I.O. submission and a completion queue. And the funny part is that um, the standard allows you up to 65k of those kind of queues. And the reason for that is to uh, support multiprocessing. What you can do is you can assign each of such a queue to a different uh, CPU core. And that, uh, yeah, that will increase the overall throughput of your drive because there is no single uh, management processor needed to, to control all the I.O. 
each core can, um, can access your flash memory individually. Uh, but there is also no restriction on the amount of submission and completion queues. Um, personally, I don't really see an application for that, but if you would like to, you can, for example, and you can see it um, over here, you can, for example, in one um, IQ lane, of IO lane, you can have two submission queues uh, where the answers will be posted in one completion queue, for example. So it's all very flexible, um, but my driver will use the most basic variant because we don't have multiprocessing yet. Uh, so um, just one um, administration queue and one IO queue. Uh, now once you've posted your command in the submission queue, and there can be multiple commands at once, you need to ring the doorbell to uh, let the FEMA controller know that there is a new command available. It will not check it automatically uh, by itself, it will simply ring the doorbell, uh, you have to ring the doorbell. And the doorbells are, create, uh, are located in um, the, the bar space of the, uh, of the drive. So it's not available through any of these queues, obviously, but you have to write directly through your PCI interface, interface to, the, to the bar zero region. Um, and in a similar fashion, um, when you have handled um, um, a message in your completion queue, you have to let the, uh, the MVB controller know that this entry is available for a uh, next completion message, so you again have to ring the doorbell. But this is also very basic when it comes to PCI Express cards because one way or another they all work in a similar kind of fashion. Now, these buffers in uh, main memory are DMA buffers. So the MVMA controller itself uses DMA to directly access these buffers. Um, and um, yeah, that means that your buffers also needs to be contagious, so no gaps in between. Um, and if I, from an, an outside uh, point of view, want to access these buffers, I also have to do the cache handling. So if I write something to this buffer, I need to flush out my cache to, uh, to DDR. And the other way around, if I want to read from this buffer, I need to flush out my cache and make sure that I get the latest information from my DDR. In case of an uh, X5K or uh, probably the A1222, uh, this is done automatically because those two uh, systems are fully cache coherent. In case of a SEM440 uh, or 460, um, you do have to do this manually. So you manually have to, to flush the caches. This is important to know when you want to, uh, to design these kind of, uh, of drivers. Now another feature of NVMe is that it can use MSIX interrupts or MSI. But the, the power of MSIX is that I can assign each of these queues to a different interrupt vector. So no need to um, handle um, the buffers um, in some kind of interrupt uh, uh, routine to see which one of the queues was uh, causing the interrupt. No, you can get a dedicated interrupt for, for each queue. Um, but, and that's a big but, unfortunately Amiga OS doesn't uh, support MSIX, and it doesn't even support MSI. Currently, at least what I know, I don't have access to any better kernels, but what I know is that we only support emulated uh, pin interrupts. And I don't have a clear evidence of it yet, but sometimes I have the feeling that these NVMe drives, yeah, are not always fully supporting these uh, legacy kind of interrupts because, well, 
if you want full speed to use MSIX, so who uses uh, these legacy interrupts anymore in combination with these kind of drives, except for OS4. So that is why I decided to do, not use um, interrupts at all. So in my latest driver, I simply um, pull the completion cues with weight, uh, with a weight function, of course, not to, uh, to have my uh, processor load at 100% all the time. Um, and hopefully, um, these drives that do, that do not behave very well with my driver now, um, yeah, maybe now work with my driver. I don't know yet because the, my new, new driver is not in the field yet, but um, it is at least my suspicion that something is going on with the legacy interrupts. So how does Metis look, uh, what does Metis look like? Um, in the top left corner, you see a submission uh, uh, command. This is what we call a command, command format. It is a 64-byte uh, command um, that consists of the opcode, so the actual command that you want to execute on your uh, on your NVMe drive. There is some uh, configuration if you want to fuse multiple commands together into one uh, command. This one is also important. Um, this is um, if you want to use a so-called physical region pages on a scattered data list. Now, an SGL was added later to the standard, and up to now I haven't seen any drive which supports this yet. So my driver only creates PRP lists uh, at the moment. And then there's the field uh, that's called the command ID, and this is just a number. So this number will also be mirrored in uh, the completion queue to match your command and to see if it's already been completed with, uh, within the NVMe uh, controller. Um, yeah, the second field is the namespace ID. So this is um, yeah the, the namespace that you want to target. But up to now, um, I only uh, have found drives that, that have one namespace. So this one is always one uh, in my driver. Now, it's not always one in my driver, but I currently I cannot uh, support multiple namespaces simply because I don't have to drive to test it out. So uh, from specific uh, uh, fields, and then uh, the uh, metadata pointer. Uh, this is also not currently in use in the drives that I have in my position, because I can imagine that, again, these uh, enterprise drives want to write some additional information to the data that you write, maybe some CRCs or this kind of information. So. Um, yeah, there's a point of view to it, but in my drivers, it's currently not used. And then we go uh, at the interesting part, because uh, now we go at the data pointers. And the data pointers can either be this field, in case of a PRP, and then the first 64-bit pointer um, points to the first 4K memory page, so your host memory page, a 4K memory page of your buffer. And the second one can uh, either point to uh, a second memory page if only one page is crossed, the one page boundary is crossed, or it can point to a an, an complete um, uh, physical region page list. And uh, this, is really, this is actually the hard part. So what you have to do is, um, well, you um, you create your buffer in main memory for, for example, data that you want to transfer to your dark drive. And now you have to uh, dissect it in a list of 4K memory pages. Um, yeah, and it really depends on, um, on how the, the application that is calling my driver has declared its buffer. If it's contagious, then uh, so in one piece with no gaps, then it's easy to create a list. If not, and you have gaps in between, then um, yeah, it's a bit harder to, to create this list. But um, 
Yeah, in the end, um, it can be an extensive list, and it takes quite some CPU power to create it. Now, in case that you have a drive with um, SGL, uh, SGL support, the Scalabrata list, then uh, you can use the OS, uh, OS4 features to get the uh, Scalabrata uh, segments. Uh, yeah, but like I said, currently uh, the drives that I have do not support SGL. So um, for now, this is not implemented. It is also an option to standard PRPs are, are mandatory. So even if drives support uh, SGL, they will work with my drive. Now here on the bottom side, you see how an uh, official uh, message uh, looks like. Uh, it's only 16 bytes uh, with some specific entries for the command that you've set to the drive. Uh, the command ID is here, so this is the same value as well, you've entered here. And this is just so, some kind of follow-up number that you can create. Um, there are no restrictions to it, except that you cannot use, um, um, what is it, 4 times F? That is uh, reserved for some reason, um, but um, otherwise than that you can create your own numbers. Um, and this one is also very important, this is the phase bit. Uh, the phase bit shows you um, the head pointer of the controller. So each time when um, the, the controller posts an, an completion entry in your completion queue, it will flip this bit. So you can check with the face bit um, yeah, where the head points or your ring buffer is. So I can imagine that this is a bit technical. Not sure um, if everybody can follow, but um, well, if you want to know more, just read the standard and everything becomes clear. <laughs> so where do you start with writing a the driver? Uh, now, first of all, you need to be able to connect your NVMe drive to your uh, to your uh, Amiga. And yeah, since we don't have an uh, an M2 slot available, we need to use the converter card. Uh, but that is not an issue because, well, if you check um, Amazon or, or these kind of uh, online shops, uh, there's a wide variety of, of all kinds of converter cards, ranging from an um, um, times one interface here in the lower corner up to the times four interface that will bring you the most bandwidth. So, um, yeah, it's actually easy to connect it to your. Uh, uh, to your X, uh, X5000 or X1000 or whatever. Uh, since we are restricted in, um, in PCI speed, uh, yeah, uh, heat sink is not really required because um, these drives start to generate heat when the transceivers on the, um, um, on the FBME cards are running at a very high speed and we are currently uh, limited to 5 gigabits. So um, yeah, we should not be worried of an overheating drive, so no uh, heating is required. Um, there are cards available with multiple slots and an um, onboard PCI Express switch. Uh, yeah, they should work, but I haven't tested it, so, so no guarantees over there. And uh, yeah, you also don't need to worry about the mid width because um, the X5000 will auto enumerate and um, they will negotiate the, the link speed that is common to both and the link width that is common to both. But I do sometimes see issues with enumeration and yeah, that is an issue of my X5000 because the exact, the exact same converter card with the exact same uh, NVMe drive does enumerate correctly on, on my PC. So, um, yeah, there's something that we might look at uh, in the future if, if possible. So then how do you start developing your driver? And yeah, that is obvious. First start with uh, reading the specifications. In this case, the specifications of interest for NVMe are a base specification, a 
the latest version is version 2.0C. It is also a my driver is based on. And there, there is a specific command set uh, specification for uh, some specific commands that are not listed in the base specification. And um, yeah, finally, um, you also need to be aware of some uh, PCI Express registers, so you also need to, to read the, the PCI transport specification. Uh, but, but that's it. All the information that you need uh, regarding developing a PCIe driver from an MPME uh, perspective is in these three standards, in these three specifications. So you do not need any prior knowledge of, of driver development or, um, or the PCI Express interface. Uh, everything you need is, is here. So now you have all the knowledge about uh, NVMe. So how do you start an actual Amiga driver? And what I did was, I simply started with a shell application. So not with a driver itself, but just an application that uh, I have called my NVMe probe. And um, yeah, in this NVMe probe, uh, yeah, the first thing you need to do is you need to find your, uh, your NVMe drive. Now, there are two ways to do it. You can uh, search for um, um, device ID and manufacturer ID, but then you only get support for a specific, uh, specific drive. What you also can do is you can search for the so-called BCC, uh, SCC, and PI. So that is the, the base subsystem, the, uh, uh, what was the SCC again? That was the, uh, something got like a subsystem ID, and then you have the PI that was the uh, programmer interface. And if you search for that, and in this case it is, uh, I think, the, the, if I remember correctly, uh, the BCC was uh, 1, the SCC was 8, and the PI was uh, 2. So if you search for 10802X, then you will find any NVMe parallel system. Now, after you find your PCI Express device, uh, it's uh, time to start implementing your ring buffers uh, because you want to bring it get to drive. And, um, and then you can set up your part uh, according to the, the base specification. There's a, a recipe in it to make it easy for you in the standards. And, um, well, after you have your uh, administrator uh, queue, then you can start to discover your, your device. And as you've seen, it is a, it's a layered structure. So, yeah, it's really like peeling an onion. Um, you start with discovering your drive, then with uh, your controller, and finally you uh, will see capabilities of your, uh, your fabric of the namespace. Um, and if this all works, um, yeah, then it's testing time. So in my case, what I did was I wrote uh, a, a, a small function that wrote a, a small buffer to, to the fabric, then uh, read it back and compare the results with, with what I intended to write. And when it was passed, then I know that I configured my drive correctly and uh, that my that all the cues were working. And this is what the output of my probe looks like. Um, here on the top left, you can see anything concerning uh, the PCI bar space. So that is, um, yeah, if you ever um, opened uh, the PCI tab in Ranger, for example, and press on the device, you will know what a bar is. And you can see these kind of values. Um, and um, <clears throat> this bar gives you information about uh, yeah, vendor and, and device ID. Uh, this is the, the address of the bar itself. Um, you can discover um, your link with, in this case, times 4, because it was connected to my X5000. 
and well, that was is running at uh, five gigabit. So the overall speed, the link speed, is uh, at uh, in number at uh, at two gigabytes. So so far so good. So then I could start uh, peeling the onion, get the supported NVMe version. So in this case, uh, for this drive, it is 1.4. Now, uh, like I said, uh, SDLs were added later. Were actually added at 1.4 of the standard, but still this drive doesn't support it. The maximum queue entries, so the maximum length of the queue is 256 entries. Um, but for the administration queue, I've configured it to only too deep. I don't need more entries because it's just uh, waiting for an answer. So why do you need more queues? I don't need speed. Um, these queues need to be in one continuous piece of memory. So this is also what the drive tells me. Uh, the standard allows to use um, uh, some printing space, but in this case, I am come across a drive that allows this. Everything needs to be one piece of memory. Um, the drive even tells me that my worst case timeout time is five seconds. So if I implement a timeout, I need to accompany for five seconds because some commands can take five seconds. Um, well, this is something. It's not so interesting. Doorbell strikes also not interesting. And here's the, the host page. Uh, like I said, um, NVMe really needs a minimum uh, host memory page size of 4K. Well, that's what uh, what Amiga OS supports. But I have seen drives that uh, support larger memory pages. Now, I have no knowledge about um, uh, operating systems, so I do not know if there are operating systems out there that support uh, larger me host memory pages, but uh, some drives support it, so yeah. Um, so once you have discovered the NVMe controller, you can go on with um, uh, discovering the controller right before your uh, actual flash memory. Now in this case, uh, it's the same uh, manufacturer as the memory manufacturer of the card. So we are talking about a Western Digital uh, card with a Western Digital NVMe controller. Uh, you get all kinds of information so like serial numbers, a firmware vision, all very interesting for later, but not so much for now. Uh, and this is also a very important parameter, and that is the maximum transfer size that an NVMe drive can support. So, if I would, for example, want to transfer two megabytes at once, then I cannot do it with a single command because the drive tells me, you know, I can uh, only transfer one megabyte with one command. So I have to split up again uh, and a command in two commands to be able to transfer two megabytes. So there's a lot of splitting going on. I, I need to split the complete transfer size in smaller sizes that is supported by the drive, and then I need to split this smaller size again in physical region pages, so in, in a complete list of 4K uh, memory blocks, pointers to 4K memory blocks, and, and uh, present this to my drive. Uh, this is also not, not very important. Here you can see that the drive only supports one namespace, uh, but yeah, like I said, uh, all the drives that I have in my possession only support one namespace, and I can imagine in the future when um, yeah, the size of the drives will increase that they want to work with multiple namespaces like a kind of paging um, feature, but for now that is not, uh, not used. And there's also something like a volatile write cache where uh, you can use onboard memory um, to uh, cache um, transfers. Um, so in this case, it means that you write something to your drive, but it is not written actually to your flash memory, it's written to cache. And this has the advantage that it will uh, extend the lifetime of your flash, 
But it has the downside that if you have a power, <laughs> a power out or whatever, and you, you, you switch off your, uh, your computer, then it could be that you corrupt your drive because the data was in your cache and not in your actual flash memory. So for now, I switch it off. Um, but what I do support is the so-called host memory buffer. Uh, NVMe drives come either with uh, DDR memory on board or not. Uh, the more expensive drives do have it, and uh, they use it to um, to increase um, the, the throughput of the drive. Um, but in this case, this uh, Western Digital drive didn't have an, uh, an onboard DDR memory, so then uh, NVMe has the option to use a bit of the host memory as an uh, as a as a write buffer. And my latest driver does support it. If you connect an NVMe drive without embedded memory, then I will uh, use a 64 megabyte uh, host memory buffer to provide this additional throughput uh, um, for the drive. Um, yeah, the downside is you will lose 64 uh, megabytes of your main memory, but uh, well, it is like it is. And finally, when you've um, added, uh, you, um, has discovered your uh, controller, then you can also discover the capabilities of your namespace. In this case, it is a one terabyte drive, so the namespace size is um, um, 931 gigabytes, because um, um, uh, a kilobyte in these kind of storage drive is not 1,024, but it's 1,000. So, uh, yeah, this terabyte, um, well, it's actually less than one terabyte, uh, the way we are use it, used to it. And this drive also supports two different LBA formats. So the traditional 512 bytes, but it also um, supports the larger 4K uh, LBA format. Um, now, we cannot use this on OS4 yet. And the reason behind this is because Media Toolbox doesn't support it. So I actually have a small tool that can reformat the drive from 512 to 4K. But as soon as I present this to Media Toolbox, I cannot create um, partitions anymore because well, it's not supported. Now you don't have to be afraid that you buy a drive where the default uh, value is 4K because all the drives come. Um, pre-formatted at uh, 512 bytes. So uh, for now, there is no issue with, uh, with using NVMe drives with, with OS4, but it would be nice if someone can remove this limitation in media toolbox, uh, if possible. Yeah. Now, this was a small introduction to NVMe. I think I could talk for another hour uh, to tell you all the features about NVMe, but that's what, not why I'm here today. Let's go to the, um, to the driver side. Now, maybe one nice thing to tell here is that it took me only two weekends to make this all work. So effectively, it took me only four days to create a program that ultimately could uh, write and read back from the NVMe drive. Unfortunately, the Amiga side was a little bit different because it took me in total about three months to get my first working driver. So, <laughs> and the reason behind this is because, unfortunately, the Amiga side isn't documented. So. Yeah, NVMe, you get the standards, you read the standards, um, you yeah, get all the information, but um, yeah, the VSI is a bit different. So what I did was, I think like every developer, you go to the amigaos.net wiki page and search for a driver, or at least for an example. And there was an example, and that was an, a run disk, but it was written in assembly. And not just assembly, but it was written for 68K. And that was, that was the only framework for a device driver that I could find. Now, 
There was also the C implementation available on uh, OS4 Depot, so I also had a look at that. But yeah, it's still a RAM drive, so it it's reserves a bit of memory and reads and writes to memory. But yeah, it's not telling the whole story. So yeah, I had to find out all by myself. And yeah, <clears throat> not sure if I did it the right way, but it works. So, um, yeah, I'm going to tell you how I did it, and if it's not, uh, not the right way, then please correct me, but um, yeah, about this one, uh, this is what, what I've learned. So first of all, never block your uh, I.O. call that you get from the caller, and the caller can be anything, it can be some kind of benchmark program, it can be a uh, file system, but never block the I.O. call. Always forward it to some kind of um, unit processing task and return the I.O. call. Because uh, the caller can either do an I.O. and wait for it, or do an I.O., continue uh, execution and check for its uh, completion later on. So, yeah, never, never block it. Um, Another thing that I learned was um, understand the context in which your functions are called. Now, by context, uh, I really mean the task. So, when your device is loaded and uh, it's configuring, and in configuring um, it's all being done in the kernel context. So, if I now here have an initialization uh, function that declares a signal, for example, um, a wave loop, then <laughs> the signal will only be, only be sent to, um, to this task. And if I want to wait to use the wave loop in my unit, pro uh, unit processing, yeah, then it will hang there because it will never receive the signal. And declaring a signal in the context of the caller, so your I own the case, is also very tricky. Because um, yeah, the caller can have declared the same signal. So be aware of of the of the context of where you execute the functions. Now another thing that I learned was is uh, make sure to only use resources that are available at the time. I mean, you're writing a driver, you are getting loaded by the kernel, and uh, not all of your resources are available already. Um, and I learned the hard way because I first created the driver and then I started learning about what is a kernel driver and, and once I knew and I added this, my driver to the kit layout, uh, well my system froze during boot up. And now that was not an issue on the classic machines, but in this case you have an issue because there is no way to get to your uh, to kick it out and to remove it again, or then to use an emergency disk of some sort. So be aware that you only use uh, resources that are available uh, when the drive is loaded by um, uh, by the kernel. So in my My driver, I used a DOS process instead of a task, and the DOS process is very convenient, but DOS uh, is loaded, well, I think a priority of mine is 100 or something. So, very late in the input up process. Other thing that I learned was, um, you have this nice field in Media Toolbox where you can select that your file system needs to align everything at a 32-bit boundary. But apparently that was only available for some legacy re uh, reasons for um, running OS4 on a classic, so for on some, uh, some power-up part, because for um, uh, the real NG machines like an X5K, this field is ignored. And I only found out after I want to, wanted to um, decompress a file on my NVMe drive because uh, archives like uh, LHA, um, yeah, they, they 
don't use any alignment at all. So you can even access uh, a single uh, buffer that is aligned on a, on a pipe boundary. Um, so what I had to do was, um, if I got a buffer from the caller, I had to check its alignment. If it was not aligned at a 32-bit boundary, I had to copy everything to an, an, a new uh, aligned buffer and then go on with processing it uh, in my NVMe driver. Um, another thing that was very tricky was um, the commands. I couldn't find any definitive list of what kind of the, uh, commands I need to support in these kind of drivers. So you have uh, track disk, you have track disk 64, you have NSD, you have SCSI, and um, yeah, which one do I need to support? So at first, I implemented everything. I implemented everything and then did a, did a debug printout to see which commands was, was used while um, um, uh, running my, uh, my driver. Yeah, so I, I got a list, but still I didn't check every program out there. So how do I know which commands I, I need to support and which not? So in the end, <laughs> I simply opened uh, a Ranger. And Ranger has this nice little feature. You can see it here on the right side. That's the query button. So I can query an existing driver. And in this case, I queried the... Um, um, the SATA driver for my X, uh, X5000, I believe, was written by by Stephen. And then I get a, a, a complete overview of what commands were supported by his driver. And that was the easy way, but unfortunately I only found out, I think, after one or two weeks uh, logging everything from, uh, from within my driver. But anyway, then I got the list. The only thing that I now need to know is um, what kind of SCSI commands do I need to support. And I was also not familiar with SCSI, so I searched the internet and found uh, a SCSI specification from, I believe it was Hitachi. Well, again, a lot of SCSI commands are out there in the world, um, but I could um, yeah, reduce the list to this one. At least. Um, these are all the, the SCSI commands that I've seen so far, and um, if there are more and you know of it uh, that I need to support, please tell me, but for now I've only implemented uh, this one. So what I found out is that uh, SCSI commands are used by the file systems and by media toolbox, and it's basically to query the capabilities of the drive, so uh, the manufacturer name, um, if the unit is ready for use, and its capacity. And that's basically all that is, um, that's all what a SCSI command is used for. Everything else is, is um, done by uh, uh, track disk commands or a new style uh, device commands. Okay, now, now we come to the most interesting part, I guess. This is the architecture of our driver. I'm not sure if it's visible uh, at the DEFCON hotel. I'm not sure if you're watching a TV screen or, or some kind of projector, but um, it looks complex, but it actually isn't. Here on the right side, you see everything that I already implemented in my probe. And this is basically everything that makes the device driver. So when the device gets loaded, everything starts with the ROM tag. Now, the ROM tag still has something special, so I'll show it to you on the next page. But the ROM tag will point to a tag item. And this tag item um, yeah, contains uh, at least three tags. There's also the end tag that I didn't show it over here. Um, the first tag. Um, is about the size of your device base. Uh, the second tag points to an uh, initialization routine, so this is where the init of the device starts. And the third tag, the interfaces tag, 
that um, um, points to a yeah, kind of table of interface pointers. Uh, one pointer that is mandatory for a device is the manager tags. And if you want to have uh, your own private functions, like in a library, you can also have a second pointer to, uh, to a tag item where, uh, where you point to your private functions. But in this case, I only implemented the manager tags. Uh, any additional features that I need were done with a custom, custom IO command. So the, the tech item of your device interface uh, looks like this. Um, there's a tag with its interface name. It has to be underscore underscore device for a device. If you were creating a library, it would have been underscore underscore library. And then there's a tag that points to an uh, effector table. And the vector table contains uh, all your interface functions. So you can here see uh, it will point to an obtain, release, open, close, uh, expunge, and also the begin and the port IO. There are also empty spaces in between, but this is information that you can easily find on, on uh, the Nico SP page, so I did not uh, uh, have an, an additional sheet about this. Um, it, it's, it, it is easily accessible information. Now the init function needs to init the device base, uh, so the set list, all this kind of information. Uh, we also want to create a message port here and then uh, uh, and a so-called min list, so a minimum list. Uh, in my case, also contains the actual initialization routines that are specific for my NVMe driver. And uh, once my complete NVMe driver has been initialized, so uh, I need to find the NVMe drive, uh, initialize the queues, discover everything, blah, blah, blah. So all that you've seen in the output of my, um, uh, my probe. Then finally, I have to announce my device to the mounter, point, uh, the mounter library. And I can do this with uh, acquiring the interface of the mounter library and call announce device tags. This is also something that I had to find out because it's also not very well documented. Not, not documented in the, the SDK, but also not in the wiki. I have seen a mention of it in um, the so-called anatomy of a SATA driver written by, by Stephen, but um, yeah. It wasn't really clear when to call it, but in my case, I've called it at the end of my uh, initialization routine, and it works. So what happens is, uh, when the mounter device uh, is, uh, the, the mounter library is loaded, uh, apparently it gets a list from somewhere and it starts mounting partitions. So this is necessary when you have your partitions mounted. Um, okay, this is. On the bottom left corner, you have the I.O. interface. So this is the interface uh, that is used by the file systems or any other program that want to access the driver. And it can do so by um, doing a do I.O. or a send I.O. command. And uh, well, it, it, it enters my, my driver through a message port. And now I have the option to either process the, this I.O. command directly, but well, most of the time this is not a good idea because I have all the execution of the, uh, of the caller. Um, so what I do again is I forward the I.O. message from this message port through the message port that I've created over here to a separate task um, for unit processing. Um, now, you can create a task for each unit that you drive supports, but, um, well, given the speed of our file systems, that is not really required. You can, you can do everything with, 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 one, uh, with one unit if you like to. So, how do unit tasks look like? What does a unit type look like? Uh, well, first of all, you need to get a message from the unit, uh, from the, uh, from the unit message port. Um, then, 
I have a case statement to see what kind of message I actually need to process. Uh, do I need to write something? Do I need to read something? Uh, do I uh, give some information about the drive, for example, the, the, the geometry or the, the manufacturer name? Um, and for my custom command, I also get, can get the smart information, so the temperature of the drive, all these kind of information. Um, but in case of the read write, um, I first have to check the buffer alignment, like I told before. If it's not allowed, I have to copy the complete buffer that is pointed to in the I/O command to my private buffer that is aligned on the right boundary. Um, once I copied it to my own private buffer or the buffer was aligned, I need to split up this buffer in all these small 4K uh, pointers. So I need to create a physical region page. Uh, once I have the page, uh, the, the list of uh, physical region uh, pages, um, I can create my NVMe message. And um, yeah, then I simply send it to the IO queue of uh, the NVMe drive. And yeah, do some manual uh, cache handling, like I said before, because I also support uh, the SEM460. And then ring the doorbell to notify the uh, NVMe drive that a new command is available. And um, then the, the MVV controller starts processing it, like uh, fetching the information from uh, DDR memory in case of a write, or the other way around, getting the, uh, the, uh, the data from, from flash and storing it in, in uh, uh, DDR memory. And I wait, uh, simply wait for the DMA to complete, and ring the doorbell again, and I've read the completion command, and uh, then I can return again. Reply to uh, the IO message port that I finished uh, executing the command. And then I start uh, at getting the next message again. Now, it would have been very nice if there was a next message already waiting for me. But it turns out that this is not true. So um, this part gets executed much faster than what the file system is doing. And um, yeah, that is a shame. I wait for the result, and then it's obvious that there's no next message waiting for me in the queue. Because when they get the result, they start sending the next message. Um, but hopefully, if when multi-core arrives, that, that might improve, and then we can get some really nice uh, NVMe speeds. Um, yeah, I already talked about the ROM tag. There's something special about it, so let's go to the next page. Um, this is what the ROM tag looks like. And, and like I told, I wrote the driver. Um, started off with using the process. It was all wrong, but I only found out uh, later on. Um, but I still didn't know how to create a kernel module. There was no information available on any wiki page or, or in the SDK what, an, um, what a kernel module is. So finally, I reached out to Steven and to Cyborg, um, so Costal, and um, they gave me the hint that, uh, yeah, um, Resident module, a kernel module is actually nothing more than a resident module. Now, well, knowing this information, I wasn't really helped yet because I did also know what a resident module was. Uh, like I said, I'm a media developer. But uh, in the end, um, yeah, if you want to create a kernel module, you need to add this flag over here. And that's all that's to it. So if you add the RTF that's called cold start, flag, then you grant yeah, then you have created the resident module. Um, yeah, so that's what I did. Um, ran into the problem, and then I used all kind of resources that were available again, so I had to remove my process and add a task instead. But when everything was out of the way and the priority of my kernel module was also okay, uh, the priority uh, needed to be lower than a mounter uh, library because uh, I called the mounter library 
to uh, to mount my uh, partitions. Yeah, but then everything was fine. Uh, suddenly, I could uh, uh, load up this driver to reboot. Yeah, so that is basically all there is to writing a device driver for uh, for OS4. Or oh, could be. Now, of course, this is not where it ends for my APME driver. I still have some features left for the future. Um, currently, my driver only supports one unit, and I want to support multiple units. Um, not that I expect that users might use multiple uh, uh, drives at this time. Um, I cannot even uh, fill my SATA drive, so uh, my NVMe drives in my system are only there because I can. I don't use them actually, but <laughs> I don't. I don't expect that um, uh, users will, will use uh, multiple NVMe drives at the time. But nevertheless, I will support multiple units. Um, I also want to uh, optimize the performance in the so-called area of interest, but what is area of interest is uh, will be shown on the next slide when I show some performance figures. Uh, something that I really want to do is implement uh, deallocate, how it's called in NVMe, but uh, well, everybody knows this trim. This is a very important feature because um, Flash-based memory works a little bit different compared to um, uh, the old-fashioned platters. The old-fashioned platters uh, do not need to erase data before you can write new data. Uh, and that is different from flash drives. Flash drives need to erase a location before you can write new data to this location. And as, soon, as, as long as your uh, flash drive is not fully written, that is not an issue. Because your controller will simply write new data to, an, uh, to a new location and, and, and do the housekeeping. But as soon as your complete drive is full, um, your flash drive, your NVMe drive, will only know that it can erase a new location once it's been written. And an erase cycle takes a lot of time. So if you do not uh, implement a DMK, the drive will, uh, your drive will uh, slow down a lot. Um, and also one, what I want to implement is uh, something called true pipelining. Now you saw that I have one task that is um, sending a command and then waiting for it to complete. But it would be nice if I have a separate task for retiring I.O. commands so that you can get true pipelining where one task is filling up this submission queue and the other one is simply monitoring when the month is complete. This is interesting for uh, when uh, our kernel will support uh, multiple uh, CPUs. Uh, yeah, but yeah, for now it's not. Uh, yeah, not, not really a, a pressing issue, and also the file systems are currently not multi threaded so uh, it's it's down on my list, but still something that I want to do. Now let's see some performance figures. Maybe this is the most interesting uh, slide of all. Um, the blue bar represents my SATA drive, so the blue the SATA drive is connected to the SATA port of my X5000. Uh, the orange one is the Solidigio P44 Pro drive, it's an NVMe drive. Um, but there's an issue with this drive because it fails to correctly enumerate in my system. So this was a drive that, was talk about, that was, uh, I was talking about earlier. This drive fails to enumerate to uh, uh, Press 2.0. It is somehow stuck at 1.0. So. Uh, the interface is, in this case, limited to one kilobyte per second and not two kilobyte per second. Uh, fortunately, the Western Digital Black and the Samsung Evo do enumerate as expected, so these two drives have the full benefit available. Um, but out of the three drives here, only the Samsung has embedded, SD, uh, yeah, embedded uh, DDR memory. Um, 
these two drives only make use of um, host memory buffers, so each memory that is allocated in the X5000 uh, DDR memory. Now, in the previous slide, I was talking about the region of interest, and the region of interest is determined by our, by our file systems. So, these performance figures were acquired by my own little benchmark program, and my own little benchmark program is doing the same as uh, SCSI Speed, uh, but SCSI Speed has a, a bug that the, some timers uh, overflow, so you get very low results. Um, yeah, my, my benchmark does that, is, so it gives the actual uh, performance figures. And what you can see is um, on the vertical axis you have the um, transfer speed, so the actual transfer speed, and on the horizontal ex uh, axis you have the, uh, the transfer size. So the size of an I.O. command that I sent to my, uh, to my FEV drive. What you see is that the larger the transfer size, the better the performance. And this is especially the case for my Samsung drive. Um, and not so much for the other drives. Um, and that is also very nice because what you can see is that the Samsung drive can reach two gigabytes and that is also the maximum speed of my PCI Express interface. Now the downside is, is that our file systems, except for SFS2, but this file system has another limitation, do not use these kind of um, transfer sizes. They are limited to uh, 120k uh, transfer sizes. So when it comes down to uh, real world speed, that we can use in our MIGAT, then this is only the area of interest. And yeah, the drive can manage up to two times the speed compared to an, a SATA drive. And, and now we see that in this case, the, the cashless drive is actually faster than the Samsung with embedded cache. So uh, for our systems, cache don't mean a lot. Uh, but it is nowhere near its maximum potential. So, um, the, when you transfer a large file, then uh, a file system like uh, NGFS will probably use um, uh, 120k uh, transfer sizes. And that means that we can transfer up to uh, 600 megabytes per second with our MIGAS. So, one third of the actual uh, uh, bandwidth. Um, it is nice, but yeah, for me personally, a bit disappointing because uh, I would have hoped that the limitation would have been in my drive, but it is uh, it's really in the, um, in the file systems. Uh, now, if you would use a benchmark program like Disk Speed, then um, yeah, all the drives perform similar because Disk Speed is only benchmarking. Uh, the cache of your system, so the DDR performance of the system, and not so much the, the actual uh, speed of your drive that, that I can benchmark or a SCSI speed should benchmark. Now, why is the speed low here? Well, partially, like I said, the file system, but on the other hand, um, especially at the very small transfer sizes, I need to create the speed of the lists. And peer P lists are time consuming, and our, our processors are not that fast compared to an uh, to a PC processor. So this is also a limitation that, uh, unfortunately, is something that I cannot do very much about it. Um, yeah, that's it. I see that. Oh, it's already 22 past uh, 11 local time, but nobody interfered. So, uh, I guess there was time left. <laughs> so, any questions? Are you kidding? <laughs> no, he's not. Go ahead. All right, so a couple of things. Uh, that was a tremendous presentation, by the way. Thank you very much for your pain. I'm sorry. Oh, you were muted, yeah. Jeremy. What's up? Would your, uh, your device pull command line? Program that the source of that detail a little bit. Sorry, it's very difficult to hear you. It's like you're further away from the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think you're having some problems on this sound, I think. 
Uh, yeah, no, I was just wondering if your uh, the the probe utility that you wrote for the um, uh, van line uh, for the shell to take and just do just do probe devices. I'm I'm was curious if the source code for that just you know that probe part was would be available. Um. Well, currently it's not. <laughs> so, okay. you know, um, it's just one of these examples yeah, that's, 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 that's missing from you know the, the whole picture. Just like just like the, yeah. the, the poor documentation of doing the device primer. It's you know it's you know the, these little techniques would be nice to be able to have small examples of how you do them. You know, the the, the probe is actually not the hard part. The probe is just following the standard. Yes. Um, and the standard has these chapters that has a that give you the recipe how to write a driver. So first you do this, then you do this. So so everything is is, is there already in, in the standard. Um, really, like I said, it only took me four days, and it is very specific for MDMA because it only contains the MDMA part. Um, the thing that would be interesting for device drivers and uh, developers is the Amiga part. And um, there I was hoping that, that it can be me, but hopefully it's someone else, that someone can create a framework and documentation about these, these basic needs that, that we developers need. So a framework of how to write a device driver. And that was why it took me uh, nearly three months. It was not the MVP part, that was, that was basically four days. Yes. Three months to, to write a device driver, um, just because the information isn't there. I mean, afterwards, with all the knowledge that I gained from simply trying, failing, trying again, failing again, and to, to get something working, uh, it took me three months. And, if we want to progress our platform, then this basic information should be available as, as, as a framework and documentation. Because the fact that I got it working doesn't mean that I did it the right way. And that is something that is bothering me. Because nobody can tell me what is the right way. Stephen. Hey, we got a question from the hotel here. Um, tell you when I hit it. Let's try it. Uh, Harold, thank you very much. The, the presentation was just excellent. And there was quite a lot to digest. Um, I would highly encourage, at some point or another, the release at, at minimum of these slides. Is that something that we can do? It's one of the best presentations I've seen on an Amigo OS device driver in some time. But the other thing also is, I don't know if you've had a chance to talk with Jamie Kruger. Um, he also ran into the documentation issue quite a bit when he was working on networking drivers. And it does seem like the people who have uh, invested as much time as you two have uh, kind of have to keep reinventing the wheel. I wonder if you would be interested in contacting him. I believe he was working on a set of skeletons, actually, uh, a framework for people to, to use as documentation, source as documentation. Uh, your experience would be very helpful in that effort. Yeah, that, that is what I was trying to say. Yeah. What, what we developers need, and I think what all developers need, is for each type of device driver, uh, I mean, I, I just brought an, um, an, um, an, an, an storage driver, uh, let's call it a SCSI device driver. Uh, but I can imagine that um, uh, Jamie has some other experience in writing an, 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 an effort driver. There are probably other do and don'ts uh, over there. And um, yeah, so it would really be helpful if someone who has the knowledge can write these kind of frameworks and also uh, some documentation uh, where the pitfalls are written down, like the do's and the don'ts. And, and, and this is something that is really missing at the moment in the SDK. And afterwards, if you look on the wiki page on amigos.net, and if you look through the SDK, all the information available there, then if afterwards I can find the information, 
not all of it, but most of it. But yeah, it's, it's not concentrated in one place specific, uh, specific for these kind of drivers. Well, and that would be very helpful. Now, am I the one to do it? Um, I could do it, at least for a SCSI here device, I can create a framework. But like I said, what I want to prevent is that I, and, and that is a bit, yeah, it's something uh, personal, that an issue that I have with, with open source, is um, open source is great, but it cannot be in substitution for documentation, in my opinion. So, if someone creates something that contains the wrong way, then everybody will copy the wrong way of creating such a driver. And um, this is my opinion, for example, on the, I think this is pronounced ACHI, so the audio system. Uh, there are ACHI drivers, open source ACHI drivers available, but in my opinion, they implement it in the wrong way. And maybe that is the reason why I can read a lot of complaints about the stability of certain drivers. Um, so, I mean, we still have developers working on the kernel. So, if someone can tell us what a driver should look like, it should be the kernel guys. Because they are loading the drivers. <laughs> So it would be very nice if uh, the kernel guys, and I don't know who, who they are. Uh, I think Steve is one of them. I'm not sure if he's in the room with you. He's, he's hiding. hiding. He's hiding, yeah. So, <laughs> Harrington Harold. Hey, he's very quiet in the moment. Yes, he is. He, and beyond that, he, he also has uh, administrative rights on OS4's wiki. So that, to oh, me, okay. it seems like that would be the place for you and Jamie, where you could add your you know, bits and pieces of code the initialization, the uh, kernel uh, modifications, uh, you know, the Kickstarter kernel um, modifications, and so on, and document them in the wiki. That's the central place to do it, the OS4 wiki. And add them yeah, there. Yeah, well, um, maybe the, the best place is, is as an example in the SDK, but uh, yeah, the wiki, wiki will, will do quite well, a the wiki, you can you know, add commentary there as well as code segments, so excerpts, and. Uh, little as I've done things, if I've tried to figure something out that wasn't in there, I added it on a few things that I've done. And we fortunately have the guy sitting here who can sign you off. So before we <laughs> release it, we'll get him to do that. <laughs> There's been trouble getting yeah. into the week. So, <laughs> so there is. Okay. Anybody else? I couldn't get in. So the only one. then I would be creating a framework for a SCSI driver as a non-software developer. Okay, that's well, interesting. But at the very least, you can at least post your experience of writing a driver, and then we've got a guy here, coincidentally the same one, who can <laughs> review your code and comments and adjust them as needed, because it's a wiki. Um, the same yeah. thing. Imagine that. Huh. Huh. Yeah, Harold, I'm, I'm looking around the hotel here, and I believe you are the expert now, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud you. <laughs> Then, then Amiga OS is really doomed. If I'm the expert, he's a hardware guy. Yeah, I'm a hardware guy. Yeah, I'm not to introduce myself, but I'm actually a system architect. So for the last couple of years, I'm not. Well, it's not fully true, but I'm not actively designing hardware anymore. Um, but as a as a system architect. You need to be specialist in one of the three areas. So my specialist, uh, I'm specialist in, in the in the electronic side. Well, now everybody can fasten a bolt, so that gives me also basic knowledge about mechanics. And uh, yeah, software. Well, apparently, I have some some hidden talent for software as well. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's my background. But yeah, mainly mainly electronics. So I'm better suited to design the next power PC board than uh, than driving uh, than the writing the uh, OS four application. Huh? Where's true? <laughs> oh no, that's Ken. Any more questions? Just one more here. Anybody else? Um, looks like we're done here at the hotel. Questions? Anyone online have questions?
you have a question? You're muted. I don't like people are lying. All right, that looks like that looks like it. Well, okay. thank, thanks, Harold. That was that was quite a, quite a in-depth speech. You know, we really liked it. I, I love the diagram you put out there. Um, I'm not a device driver, but I could actually kind of follow along. So great. Yeah, I, I've never participated in a DEF CON. I actually never watched uh, the DEF CON uh, stream, so I didn't know what to expect. So maybe it was a bit too much, I don't know. But, uh, no, no, no we're we, very, we have some very in depth conversations, and we have some very light conversations. It's all over the board, but yours was perfect. Okay, well, uh, my pleasure. Uh, I will create PDF out of this uh, presentation, and um, I will send it off to, I think, Stephen. Oh, no, uh, Bill, I also have your email, so I can send it over to you and Ask maybe you want to uh, put his online somewhere. Ask him when oh. he's going to put his driver. Yeah, yeah. so the question here was when uh, are you are you going to repost your answer. drivers to uh, OS4 Depot or, <laughs> or what do you, what's the file uh, there? You, you probably have inside knowledge. Uh, no, um, I made a decision to um, change the way I like to distribute my drivers and it was mainly driven because I want to support the parties that still are willing to move our platform forward. And if this sounds a bit cryptic, then, well, nah, I don't think it's cryptic. I think you can already <laughs> mention how I can, how I go to this group of drivers. So uh, stay tuned. They will be available again, but not an OS4 Okay. All right. Well done. 